Welcome to the Millennial Mic. I'm Ali. I'm Joe. And, and this is the Millennial Mic. Content for us, by us. I'm so happy for you. <laughs> okay. Are you ready? No, but go ahead. Are you ever going to be ready? Never. <laughs> okay, Joe Marie. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a special Chapter 9 experience. Woo! We are your hosts. I'm Ali. I'm Joe. And today, I'm just the host, <laughs> Ali. <laughs> so today, my very special guest is my co-host, Joe Marie Malcolm Gordon. As you may or may not know, Joe Marie is a civil attorney turned brand strategist with over a decade of experience in brand strategy and graphic design. Jo has created a dynamic career, leveraging her legal expertise to elevate the branding experience for every client. Jo has become everyone's favorite brand expert by helping introverted professionals build an authentic personal brand online. Jo is founder and chief branding maverick of Malcolm Maverick's Creative Consultancy and the communications director of Corp Care. As a part of her commitment to civic engagement, Jo is a member of the Global Shapers Kingston Hub. She also serves as the president of Campion College Alumni Association and volunteers with her church community. Jo Marie provides mentorship and education to young entrepreneurs and branding novices. She enjoys engaging with audiences at a variety of speaking engagements and has a deep-rooted passion for emceeing events, weddings, and shows. She recently launched none other than the Millennial Mike podcast with me <laughs> and <laughs> co-host the weekly show available on all of the most popular podcast platforms and of course YouTube. Jo is a branding boss, loyal lawyer, millennial mogul, and education enthusiast who also loves alliterations. Welcome to your own <laughs> show, Jo Marie. <laughs> How does it feel to sit in your usual seat? Super awkward. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for that very warm introduction, Ali. Um, low key wondering who you're talking about, but you said me, so I, I, I guess it's me. Um, but it yeah. is you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'll just pretend like I have no clue what's happening. Okay. Just, yeah. Well, at like the Millennial Mic, we typically start off with a couple <laughs> warm up questions. Okay. So, Joe, could you share with our audience what your favorite meal is and why? Okay, um, so my favorite meal is stew peas. That's how it's always been. She ever ate since. that right before this episode. Yeah, like literally. <laughs> I watched this life. I don't know what. That sounds would awkward. Have. Like that, I watched you. I yeah, also ate I'm lunch. Okay. I also ate lunch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. No, I don't know where the love for it came from, but it's just comfort food. And then, especially it because is. of my shift, um, to becoming a pescatarian, it's still. I'm still able to eat it all beat without pig's tail now, but ah, the moment of silence for that. Um, <laughs> for the international audience, really you have never same. had stew peas with pig's tail. You are missing out. Missing out significantly. But yeah, that's what it is. Okay. I like that. Stew peas is definitely comfort food. It really There's no, is. really no way around it. Okay. Most amazing place you've ever visited or your favorite place to visit? Um, okay, so the most... I feel like... Uh, no, I'm not going to guess. Yeah, no, the most the most <laughs> exciting place I've been to was Ecuador. Oh. And what I, what I liked about it is that, of course, you're literally on the equator. And they have, a, they have a site there where you have... What do you call it now? You are straddling a line that puts you into different time zones. And I just thought that was really cool. Here really comes fun. the nerd. <laughs> all dressed... <laughs> In red <laughs> glasses. <laughs> yeah, no, I just thought it was really fascinating because I, I mean, I'm not a big like geography. Student, no, I know, I love those things too. Fact, it's amazing. <laughs> as a matter of fact, I went to geo class. I was not a geo student. Very big difference. Um, but yeah, I really enjoyed that experience because going to somewhere that, from a temperature standpoint, I mean, you're close to the equator, but it's still so cold. I was like, where am I? <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it was a really, really exciting experience and I, I had a good time. I had a good time. All right. I love it. I also love that being on earth has become cool. Like yeah. with our generation. Oh, for or for sure. Because love it. I think just education is, is, is attractive. Like being educated, learning more. It's yeah. It's a whole it's vibe. It's also so fun. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. 
I like this one. Mm. It's my favorite one. No, no. What is your husband Warren's nickname for you and how did he come up with it? Oh, wow. Um, this is a PG environment. I joke. <laughs> wow. I was not expecting that. I joke. Okay. No. no, Ali acting brand new because she asked me this question before for something. That's why I want the I people know. to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is this entire interview is going to be a setup, I feel. Um, because we know each other. What life. is the... No, <laughs> well, the thing is, he, he has this thing where he says he doesn't like the fact that he he calls me Joe because Joe is traditionally a man's name. So he has reverted to calling me June, which is very special because one, it's my birth month. And also I guess it's much more feminine than Joe. Um, but yeah, June is, June is a nickname. Beautiful is a nickname. Um, oh, Joe, that's... when, when he, he has forgotten that it's, it's super masculine. Um, and <laughs> or yeah. when you're in public. Oh yeah. We're not, no, as a matter of fact, he likes to call me Miss Malcolm. I'm just like, sir, have that's you true. forgotten? I have heard that before. <laughs> Yeah. Have you forgotten your last name is But like too? the other day when he called me from your phone, mm-hmm. he was like, Joe left her phone with me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think didn't know what to do about that. But I think also, also where <laughs> people is just like, yeah, how do I help you here? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think when he knows that other people call me, call me Joe, then he refers to me as Joe in that context. So, okay. Yeah. Got you. Mm-hmm. Well, I call you Joe for anyone who didn't know that yeah. on the show. I mean, <laughs> Most it, people, as a matter of fact, tune into no episodes. If you less <laughs> people call me Joe Marie. Like when people call me Joe Marie, it takes a, it takes some time to react. To go, I'm like, no, yeah. nobody Usually, does I that. reserve Joe Marie for like the Drake portion. Yeah, the very oh, serious yeah. conversation. Right. And of course, I call you by your middle name when it's Drake. okay. We're not oh, going to okay. talk about that. that <laughs> be, oh, okay. All right, jumping into the hard stuff, Joe. Oh, oh no. <laughs> We didn't get to talk about this on our warm-up episode because mm-hmm. we we're really just trying to share more about, you know, who we are and what we believe in in the warm-up yeah. episode. And I really wanted for you to break down your kind of professional journey for our audience, maybe into a couple different steps. So, like, yeah. where it started and how you've gotten to where you are now. Um. Okay, so a few things. When I was 10 years old, I knew that I wanted to be a lawyer. Um, a very direct reference ten? for me at 10 years old, yeah. Um, a very direct reference for me was my mother because she's a lawyer, but it wasn't one of those typical child parent situations where it's like, oh, you have to be a lawyer because I'm a lawyer. It was, I got to literally see my hero and the future of what I could become while growing up. And so I was just like, yeah, I want to be whatever that is. Mm. Um, so that's where the whole interest in law came from, but also I found that law was just the career that like really fit my personality. Yeah. Um, not that I'm an argumentative person naturally, but <laughs> okay. we've been known to debate. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> we've been known to debate. Um, and also it was really just an opportunity for me to step into the different facets that really make me a, a, the person I am today. So public speaking, engagement, helping people. It was the career that has had everything together. So fast forward to undergrad um i'm one of the few people i think that did not enjoy my undergrad experience at all i preferred law school any day any time and then mm-hmm. when i say that to people they're just like what do you mean um <laughs> because apparently law school is harder but it's not it's not so much the harder component it's more so the fact that it was more practical it was more yeah. hands-on you, you could actually like go to court yeah. and you got to see things really happening so for me that was something that was so important and so critical in making that decision and when you were in law school were you like this is where i need to be yeah yeah because up until getting into law school i was like i actually had a very powerful conversation with my mother and i said honestly mom i'm not sure this is what i want to do anymore because these teachers are just upsetting my spirits and i can't really bother but what she said to me um by her bedside was that just finish the law. You can't do anything else after. Just finish the law because you've started the process. You know, this is a career that can actually propel you forward in other respects. So just finish it and and, and complete it. And I think what was very important to note in that context is that my mother always knew that I was not just an academic or I was not just a lawyer, that I had this creative energy that yeah. was very strong and very much she wanted to help me nurture it. But being a mother, she's also looking at the fact that Miss, I um, you need to finish the people on school. And you need <laughs> to you need to put all of that together. But um, but yeah, so that would have been the journey into law. 
Mm-hmm. Um, law school would have graduated. And then, but concurrent with that journey was my creative exploration. So there would have been in 2008, December 2008, um, a few weeks prior to that, I needed something designed. I asked somebody, they took forever. And in true drummering fashion, I said, well, I must can learn this myself. So December 2008, I actually opened Photoshop for the very first time. I was just like, I think all designers have this story where they were like fascinated with the brushes or something. I just made like looking at my earlier designs. I was just like, you're a hot man. <laughs> It was, it wasn't good. It wasn't good at all. But, um, but, but they're really open a fascination with graphic design. Wow. And I really like the fact that you could create anything. Like I can't draw, but I can put things together that make it look like I can draw, you know? Um, so just the ability to really pour my creative energy into a venture that would be so life fulfilling even 12 years after, um, was just really important for me. Yeah. So, running the law course, running the creative course at the same time, there would have still been a very key, I guess a key distinction in terms of like, you know, what I wanted to do and where I was going because law has a very clear path. Like Mm -hmm. you go to, you do your undergrad, you go to Norman Manley for two years. A part of your Norman Manley education is that you actually have to do an in-service for 10 weeks in order for you to graduate. And even that story made me realize that, you know, it, it was so important for me to just be open to disruption yeah. and open to the fact that whatever plan I had might not work. Because in my second year of law school, I decided to work while going to school. Um, a cautionary tale, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, cautionary tale. Um, a lot of people said it would be hard, but I do believe that if you're going to do it, you need to have a big enough why, because it's not easy at all. Yeah. Because I didn't have like a school life per se, in my second year, because I literally, as class is over, I'm bolting to Duke Street to go to work. So it was a really, it was a really fascinating experience in terms of balancing the two things. But even getting to where I was right. in terms of my in-service, um, I mistakenly thought that I would be doing my in-service with my mother because naturally, um, <laughs> I was like, you know, you got a lot of practice. I need to practice. Just show up. And <laughs> I got we'll, a lot we'll of now. <laughs> She was like, nope, no, ma'am, <laughs> not today. <laughs> um, and so I had to I had to go and find work. And I remembered that I had sent my resume everywhere. Like by the time she had told me this would have been March, most of my peers were looking for jobs from December of the previous year. So I was three wow. months behind. And I was like, which can be so unnerving to like yeah, a young person you don't in there. Hear, first of all, you're not hearing anything. You're mm-hmm. delayed. And then on top of that, when you do hear something, it's not positive. Right. So I remember going on Twitter and saying, all right, well, I'm just going to be positive in this moment because I don't know what else to do. And at that time, um, Peter Levy, the managing director of DCIC, would have reached out to me on Twitter and was like, hey, what type of law are you interested in? I was like, sir, I'm interested in the kind of law that will help me graduate these people's institution. (laughs) Um, And then he was like, he was like, oh, you know, because insurance companies, they need a lot of legal counsel. And so it would be great if you sent your resume to the, you know, insurance companies. I hadn't thought of that. And that's why being open to disruption is so important because everybody, when you come out of Norman Manley, they're really pushing this whole notion of you need to work at a firm and firm is the only option when really you can work in a private entity and that's not a problem. So long story short, after having that conversation with him, um, he subsequently would have said, hey, do you want to apply here? I'm just like, okay. (laughs) Um, And then having applied, It wasn't until I got there that I learned that the job didn't exist, Mm. that it would have been created. And for me, that was really testimony to alignment because there, I I didn't know Mr. Levy beforehand. It wasn't one of those situations where this is somebody trying to assist somebody they know. I would have been a virtual stranger to him. Yeah. Um, and I I'm forever grateful and forever indebted to for to him rather for really taking a chance on me because up until that time, I really didn't know what my choices were. And so that story is key to understand how I would have been there for five years. Um, Mm. And I would have grown in terms of moving from part-time student, part-time worker to full-time worker to legal officer um, to one of the more senior legal officers there. 
And by the time I would have left in January 2019, I felt like the corporate environment prepared me for the world of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Because And do you think that Mr. Levy gave you the confidence to take a chance on yourself in the way that he took a chance on you? Definitely. And I think that it's so important when persons give you that opportunity that you really don't, you take it and run with it. Yeah. Because I appreciated even in, in 2013, I would have been 22. I appreciated that in that moment, I was also representing him mm. because he would have had to speak to his managers and his directors and say, hey, we're creating this post for this person. Mm -hmm. So I knew that upon leaving or at any point in time, I was really representing him. Yeah. So giving me that confidence, yes. And also the vote of confidence was needed, especially at a time when I really, really was giving up on the situation. Not going to lie to you. Um, but but before I got negative, I got positive. Yeah. Before I got like complaining, I'm just like, well, you know, it's perspective. If it is that it's going to happen for you, it will. And it was the funniest thing when HR called me one year later and said, by the way, we don't, we don't have a file for you. I'm just like, um, I've been here for like a whole year. I feel like this is what you don't file for me. Mm -hmm. They're like, yeah, no, we just remember you came, you did your work. And then, no, we need to get a file for you because we're going to offer you like formal employment. So I was like, oh, okay. Cool, 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 cool. <laughs> yeah, that file makes sense. No. Um, so, yeah, so the journey would have moved from, you know, formal education working part-time, working full-time, leaving my job, a journey in and of itself that really was, I mean, a lot of people ask me about leaving my job because the truth is I did not plan to leave my job. BCIC. You see, she always of, just preempts my questions. Yeah, I know? didn't plan to. Here I was going to go into how did you leave corporate? Yeah, you know? Okay, let's pretend like. So Ali asked me, guys, how did I leave corporate? And Joe Marie says. Okay, but wait, um, let's track it back for the audience sure. for a second. So yeah. you get into law school. Yeah. You do your undergraduate degree first. You get into Norman Manley yeah. Law School here in Jamaica. Yeah. You pursue your law degree. Yeah. In order to complete your law degree, you have to seek out an internship yeah. in some kind of law, any yeah. kind of law. Mm -hmm. Mr. Levy takes a chance on you. You end up taking an internship with him, right? working with him for much longer than you would have needed to right. for school purposes, right. taking a formal job with them, right. engaging in some creative work along the way, yeah. and really discovering your passion for graphic design, branding, yeah. All because the way actually, to stepping out on your own. Because actually what I should add is that while I was at BCIC, I did the the, the ratio of law work to creative work was was almost like 50-50. Oh, wow. Um, okay. So the first thing that I actually did was they were trying to revive the company magazine. Mm. And um, they had, <laughs> it's kind of funny to say it now, but they wanted to do the magazine. And... Um, they knew that as a graphic designer. So <laughs> they were like, oh, so you can do the magazine? I was like, yeah, that's no problem. That's no problem. I got it. <laughs> Ali, I had never designed a magazine in my life. But I said, <laughs> I said, you know what? I'm going to figure it out, as with all things, because something that is really a personality trait is, is the notion of, yeah, man, everything can be figured out. Everything is figure outable. I think that's actually a, a Marie Fo um, Folio book. Um, because what I, what I, dis what I thought about was, I don't know how to do a magazine in the context of a magazine, but I know how to design the elements yeah. of a magazine. So, so you just need to learn to put it together. So the magazine <laughs> then moved into, you know, emceeing the, um, the, the company dinner to, you know, doing presentations at the staff meeting about the remodeling of the building to, just so many different things. So what I appreciated the most about my experience at BCIC is that I became a whole person. Mm. I didn't, it was the first time I really got to run the parallel between my creative and legal side while, while realizing really and testing the theory that this is something that could coexist. Right. Because for a long time, I really wasn't sure because the way creativity is pitched to you as a child is that it's a hobby. Mm. It's not something that you can really launch out into um I'm, I'm just really grateful that my mother would have had a certain opinion as it relates to 
being the whole person and developing the whole person. It was never just, even though she wanted me to do law, it was more so I want you to be the best that you can be and to really step into your potential in a meaningful way. Yeah. The person who really made me feel like creativity was a little problematic was my father. And then the thing with the thing about our relationship, which most people may or may not be aware that I'm not like super close to my father, but at the same time, I can appreciate his, the very key role he played in my life is that he would have actually demonstrated, even though he didn't speak to me about it, just how creative he was. Mm. Like, I was that child who, you know, when you have, like, you have to build a tone. <laughs> you have to build a tone in, like, proper primary school. And they, they normally get those assignments for, like, two to three weeks. I was that child that was showing up at 5 o'clock in the morning on the due date, like, um, daddy, uh, this is you today. <laughs> He's like, um, all right. And then two twos. Patex, cardboard, we'll have a tone. So <laughs> it was a weird thing because my mother actively encouraged Don't me. Don't worry, I would never have guessed that you are the child who showed up like the day of the assignment. Oh, yeah, man. No, the adult I am today learned from the child I was. Okay. For progress. sure. <laughs> for we sure. For progress. sure. progress. Because it's going to grow. Because, no, man, I was definitely the child that did that. But so, yes, yeah, so it was a weird dynamic because I had my mother who was actively encouraging that kind of creative exploration. Like, literally, every time I go to the house, and, of course, she's the type of mother who keeps everything that you've ever done. So, like, I see all yeah. the trophies and stuff that <laughs> I have, and I was just like, wow, I lived a full life. Um, and Me, then, and then, while at my house, we're like, "Where's my high school <laughs> diploma?" <laughs> we're, we're like, my pa- I know my parents are proud of me, but we yeah. just we're like we have a hard time figuring out where everything. Is. Yeah, no man, she has a. System. My mother keeps like all the notes I wrote to her. Yeah, you know, like same. The, literally, I'll have written a post-it and put it on her mirror at age five. Yeah, we can't find that. What the high, <laughs> high school, school diploma? diploma? We don't know. Uh, no, but sure. I find that I find that mothers are really sentimental that yeah. way because my mother has this thing where she's like you don't have to get me a gift but a, but a card means yeah. the world to her oh and my mother is no balling card. with the card I'm like you haven't even owned a present yet. she's like it's a yeah. card <laughs> <laughs> no like don't give her a card without writing though don't feel like Hallmark or oh, no. Oh, whoever no. American greetings can capture your thoughts no, oh no you that's my grandma my grandma yeah. would be like you'll give her one line she'd be yeah. like oh wordsmith you know like she's like everything they just you, want to see it. everything you everything you do is amazing you know like she's just like oh you're just you're just wonderful you're so special I'm so, I'm so proud of you. <laughs> yeah but um but yeah so being in an being in an ecosystem where it was actively um encouraged while at the same time being anchored to this notion that education is really important and you have to yeah. focus on that it was always a question of, can I do both? Am I able to do both? And then as a serial multitasker, like I really had to figure it out for myself. Because when I look on the trajectory of my life, like up until 29, um, I was just always doing things. Like even in prep school, I was in Builders Club. I was doing the most. Yeah. I was doing you like just whatever. didn't see your creativity yeah. as like a career path. No. Yeah. So... So now when I tell people that, you know, I'm doing brand strategy and they're just like, how did you even figure that out? I said, I had to do research because it's not like a law degree where I know all the requirements yeah. without even trying. Yeah. It's and even the idea of a brand strategy, particularly in the context of a place like Jamaica, yeah. would be a very modern yeah, Career very path, modern, very you know? modern construct, and and that's why a, a big leap mother, of faith, particularly for somebody who has a law degree or had yeah. access to, yeah, yeah. And what you realize is that the conversation about leaving my job is more about for some people, not for me, but for other people, it's like, but you're a lawyer. Like I never forget um, an attorney who, quite frankly, I found it very strange that she of all people was asking me this question. But anyways, that's a different story. Um, she was <laughs> like, like we're she was like, if you were my, <laughs> she was like, if you were my child, you know, I don't, I said, I said, I said to her respectfully, I said, well, I guess it's a good thing I'm not your child. Wow. Um, These because, are Joe Marie's <laughs> slapbacks. <laughs> because. Slapbacks? It's clapbacks, right? Yeah. Not clap slapbacks. Back. No, slapbacks are a whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, I know she didn't mean anything by it because the truth is not every parent can parent a multipotential life. And that's really the situation. Not every parent can parent a multipotential Okay, life. I have a theory on this. Mm-hmm. I think everyone is a multipotentialite. Yeah. And we are not nurtured to believe that that is okay. 
Exactly. That were nurtured to believe that like... You have to pick one. You know, the jack of all trades, master of none idea. Yeah. I was I'm literally reading Stacey Abrams' book today and she mm. talks about that. Yeah. She's like, you know, I wanted to write romance novels, but I also want to be a politician. Like, I am allowed to be both, you yeah. know? Um, and I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind when shaping the minds of really yeah. young kids and people. Because when you're talking to young people, when you're talking to even adults now, I know so many lawyers who are running from their law degree yeah. actively. Yeah. Like, they go to the office, they hate court. I say, so why are you going to court? They're like, oh, but how are you going to court? I say, I love court. Court, yeah. court gives me a high. Like, I can't explain that to you. Yeah, I think but if I was a lawyer, court would be. Yeah, because court <laughs> is where the action happens. Court is where, like, the, the first time. You know? understand? That's like, <laughs> that's we're trying to be Harvey Specter old chair. You understand? <laughs> but, like, yeah, because the first time I went to court, like, low-key, I wrote everything I wrote. Everything By I the way, guys, say. Jo Marie dresses like she's going to court. Even Every day. if, like, for right now, I am in a t-shirt. <laughs> Maybe like mid length shorts. This is super casual. Let's let's give mid length shorts. <laughs> My hair is in a but Jomri has on a bandu, a sweater, <laughs> long pants, some slip on, beautifully cleaned white shoes. I cannot. Her manage. hair is perfectly done. Her handbag is sitting gracefully. <laughs> okay, I I'm love gonna, I love the descriptions for the people. <laughs> for real. Okay, but wait. Before we get carried away in why I would want to be in court and why you like court mm -hmm. more than anything else. I want to ask you. Yeah. I have so many questions I want to ask you that I feel like maybe you've answered some of them, maybe you haven't. Kind of, but kind of where difficult. in this path mm -hmm. did you find the biggest challenge? Was it in, you know, realizing that you could balance both the, mm -hmm. the, the creative side and the legal side? Yeah. Was it taking the leap from leaving corporate to actually becoming an entrepreneur? Yeah. Was it in really developing the mental fortitude to manage comments like the comment that that woman made to yeah. you? Um, and then after that, I have one more question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Just preparing you to let you know I got more I, in I'll, store. Okay, mom. <laughs> um, no, the, the thing is, if... To rank the challenge would be, it would be a little difficult because I think all of them equally compounded to make the hurdle, um, to make a hurdle that I could jump over into, into my purpose. So let me explain that part. Um, the first thing about comments that people would make is that there's still that very old school thinking that creativity, the arts is something that you do for fun. Mm. And a law degree in the face of brand strategy or marketing or anything creative just is so formidable that one cannot even fathom why would you leave that to know go and do what exactly because one of the things that i struggled with which is why as a brand strategist i advocate for people knowing their one liner is actually to combat those kind of comments because mm -hmm. sometimes you don't know how to explain what you do because mm -hmm. brand strategy is not something that is already acceptable or if i tell you i'm a doctor you're not asking me questions if i tell you yeah. i'm a lawyer you're really not asking me questions i say brand strategies to you you're just like okay like okay like, that sounds fun <laughs> you know yeah. that sounds like you're having a good time um so for me it was really cultivating a mindset that appreciated that my journey was my own and it wasn't for me to explain it to anybody per se or to seek permission but for me to really just be true to who I am and really step into the purpose that I was supposed to so that was one aspect leaving my job let me tell you something kids okay <laughs> um if you're somebody who loves the 25th of the month because you know that regardless of what o'clock a strike money shall be in your account leaving your job becomes a little becomes a bit um it there's a bit of trepidation you. okay <laughs> and the trepidation is not only just you know financial stability because mind you you do have people who their financial backing is is at a place where they would have planned to leave for me the challenge with leaving my job is again i think i started the conversation with i did not plan to leave on October 21st, 2018, this would have been a Sunday, I believe, I was in church and God very clearly said to me, you know, I had been praying about it for a while because the, the internal struggle with reconciling who you are as a person, especially when you're in the middle of a high stressed, high pressure job, is that you start to wonder things like, is this really for me? Mm. Um, and it's not it's not that you hate the job because one of the things that I keep telling people, because everybody assumes when you leave a job, you hate the job. I loved my job. Mm -hmm. Every day I showed up living in my purpose because I got to help people in a very tangible and meaningful way. However, 
there comes a time when you have to look at your purpose as it's either helping or hindering your peace of mind, your mm. sanity, your everything. And for mm-hmm. me, it was getting to a place where the workload was ridiculous. Um, I didn't feel like it was sustainable. And so I had started to really pray and ask for discernment because I don't I don't think anybody should just leave their job like that. Let, let me hasten to say, leaving your job is a calculated risk you need to take. And if it's not calculated, it needs to be moved by something else um, that is really calling you elsewhere. So for me, when I got that in October, um, it was, you know, just contextualize the whole notion of spiritual and, and divine conversations is that it's not strange. It's just pointing you in a direction and forcing you to take action because otherwise you'll just sit there and not do anything. And why I felt like that was my push to take action is that I am a structured person. You know this, Ali. Mm-hmm. You know that spontaneity and me are not really, it's it's not as bad as oil and not water. Not close friends. Yeah, we're not close. You know, we ain't, we ain't best friends. Um, But it's more so because like, like everything, the reason I even got into strategy is because it naturally flows with the, the essence of who I am as a person. So when I thought about it, I'm just like, no, but you know, every all the financial savvy people tell you that you must have six months um salary put down. And I'm looking at it and saying, yo, I had just, I would have just acquired like property. And I'm just like, where is this money coming from? Because your immediate reaction, and that's something like I want to talk to really quickly, your immediate reaction goes to financial, but your immediate reaction needs to really go to possibilities. Because mm-hmm. if we go to financial, we forget the very important thing that your finances and your financial stability doesn't have to be from you. It can be in the form of grants. It can be in the form of sponsorship. It can be in the form of people helping you. So I later learned that. But initially, I was like, no, fam. I know, 25th of the month. I'm here for that. Yeah. Um, But when a calling is on your life, you have to listen. Because if you don't listen, it's going to get louder. And it's going to disrupt you, which is what happened. So when it, so why that calling was so significant for me and the way it happened is the fact that I, I know that inactivity is as a result of hesitation and doubt. Mm. And it could have easily been where, oh, yeah, man, I'm not doing that. Mm-mm, check my back. Um, but I found that I couldn't avoid it anymore. Yeah. I think I had avoided it for years. Somebody asked me before, like, can you picture yourself in an office? And I told them no. So when I saw myself five years in a corporate setting, I was like, well, at what point did I lose the conviction that I used to say no to that question? Right. And did I say yes to it in the name of necessity or whatever? So anyways, long story short, um, leaving it. So fast forward from October 2018 to January 2019, stepping into the entrepreneurship world, I must say is easily one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. Not, not even from a financial stability standpoint, just the mere fact that yeah. you you start to understand how people view lawyers versus creatives. Mm. And that viewpoint directly impacts how you move as an attorney, as a, as a, as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. So when I had legal clients in terms of like, you know, helping them to review contracts, I'd send my invoice, invoice pay, no question. When I'm doing graphic work, which is, you know, designing your brand identity, which anybody who appreciates the importance and the value of that, would realize that it's really equally, it's on equal footing. I mean, it's not as life or death as law, but it's definitely on equal footing in terms of the value creation process. And people would be like, no, but why are you paying so much for this? And I just, uh... and I was so jaded by that process because the pricing mechanism that everybody ascribes to is value-based pricing. Yeah. So it's not for me to tell you, I can't, t- it's not a commodity-based thing where I can say to you that it took, Hey, this, this is going to rate. this and yeah. blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So for me, that was like a mindset challenge because even now, as much as it's been a year and what, 10 months later, I still find that the trigger to price things and the trigger to really tell people, hey, this is what it costs was significantly hindered to the point where I had to create parameters for myself because otherwise I'd have just given away everything in the name of, well, I just focus in on what I'm doing. Right. So that was challenging. Um, but definitely, all in all, I think the biggest challenge was actually being confident in the fact that I could do what I'm doing and let go of this notion that being a brand strategist is, 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 is not going to be successful or being a brand strategist is, is a little crazy for Jamaica because where are you going to find clients, blah, blah, blah. Like I right. had to silence that voice yeah. and pay attention more so to hey, you can do this 
Um, and so just figure out how you're going to do it, ask questions and, and to anyone who is interested in the brand strategy field or marketing or anything in the creative space, do your research. Yeah. I have been, and you are also getting clients at this point in time, right? So actually you you did have like, there was proof in the pudding. Yeah. But, but here's the, but here's the dangerous world of entrepreneurship, Ali. The, The truth is a lot of people waste your time. And I think that for the first three months, it was a lot of wasted time. So I didn't didn't realize things like, okay, I'm so enthusiastic about my work and the things I do that being a professional is something that doesn't elude me. But I realized that there's an added layer of professionalism that you need to exhibit in the creative space. Meaning you just don't do anything until people pay or sign a contract. Just Mm. don't even, don't even open Photoshop, don't even waste your time. Because the first mistake I made was I was so excited about getting my first client. My first yeah. client was literally like the 25th of January. I'd left my job the 24th. So I was just like, yeah, first day out. Come We're on. doing this. <laughs> <laughs> so when I show up to the meeting and I ask the very critical question of what's the budget and they couldn't answer me, I'm just like, but you guys requested rush work, which is priced differently. You right. required this rush work. I figured you were planning to pay for it somehow. So I don't really understand how right. we don't have a budget. And that, but with each experience, I became, I don't know how to put it, but really and truly, Ali, I became apprehensive. But at the same time, I was learning. Like more savvy. Going, you yeah. started to be able to identify, yeah. like, you could who see, was you being could see really the manipulation real from a mile yeah. away. And yeah. there are certain things that really just tell that to you immediately when the, based on how the person approaches it. Yeah. So, yeah, so that was a really big adjustment for me because it's different when you're in a corporate setting where your payment is subject to a metric that is really external to you. Yeah. You've accepted this offer. You just know, say, at the 25th of each month or the 23rd because you get Scotia the same used to be, you know? in. know, a little early. <laughs> um, but then when you have to go out there and really fend for yourself in that space, you're dealing with a lot of... I, I don't think a lot of entrepreneurs talk about the emotional side of entrepreneurship. Mm-hmm. The rejection, the feeling like people are wasting your time, the feeling like you're not good enough, the feeling like you don't have the social proof to step into the same league as other people. Like, we need to have those conversations yeah. because my confidence immediately was shot like month one, month two. Because yeah. I was like, what am I doing now? Because yeah. you finally build up the confidence to step out on your own. Yeah. And then you have to deal with like all of the challenges of yeah. being and you, an entrepreneur. And you deal with those challenges. But here's the truth. You have to eventually decide for yourself that I am going to be this person because this is what I'm supposed to do. And the way I really started to overcome like the feeling of the real voice of imposter syndrome was just doing. Yeah. It got to a place where I was like, look, I need to study. Like as much as I'm not, I'm not big on studying. I don't think that's a positive thing to say, but here we are. <laughs> I think it's fine. This is a safe space. This no, a meaning. Space. I hate studying. My, my, I have, yeah. Yeah. We my both have two studying. degrees and yeah. we don't you like You understand? My love for studying yeah. came after I left school because the type of student I was, the, the delivery method in traditional schools was not suited for that. So, um, so what I was trying to say is, I consumed information in the same way that I would have if I was in law school, the same way I would have yeah. in everything else. Because the truth is you have to study for anything yeah. that's worth to build doing. Build up your arsenal. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I want to know. The people want to know. The, the people, world wants to know. The world. The most surprising thing about Joe Marie Malcolm Gordon. Go. Wow. Oh. <laughs> the thing that you would think people think is the most surprising thing. I don't even know because I think what surprises a lot of people, which is probably not the best answer. So let me see. Um, I, okay. Run it. Yeah. And then I'll tell you if like maybe that didn't surprise me. And it's not going to <laughs> surprise you. <I> think. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot okay. be the benchmark for this question. Okay. Um, Fair enough. <laughs> I, think, I think what's surprising for people is that like me having anxiety, for example, is mm. something a lot of people can't wrap their minds around because based on 
my online persona or, you know, who I am when they interact with me, they're just like, oh, because people don't understand how anxiety works. Yeah. So they don't understand that there's such a thing called high functioning anxiety. Where so, we live together. Yeah, we live <laughs> and we dwell and, we, you know, so I think that's something that people find very surprising and yeah. I'm pretty open about it because I'm yeah. just like, I didn't know what it was until I, I did some research. So yeah. studying is great. Yeah. I'm um, really glad that we did wellness week so yeah. that everyone had a chance to interact with mental health and yeah the wellness. mental health professionals and because you know from the ladies from centered and and dr shea bowen like it, they really would have driven home even in their own personal vocations they would have driven home the point about just really tapping into knowing what is happening with you on that level because and they're mindsets, all entrepreneurs and yeah in the healthcare space which is really which cool. which really gives you like the balanced approach to really understanding what it takes to be in this space so yeah, yeah. um so i think that's surprising i think also my age surprises a lot of people for some reason in both ways yeah so they're like we thought you were older or we thought you were younger because i'm i'm perpetually carried for things until i open my mouth <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. so yeah like, I, I, am a, I am a hard american like under 16 um yeah yeah, yeah for sure like you last... could not walk into a club <laughs> no in new york club, and not, get not a thing they're yeah. just like um and then i think what surprises them is that hold on you're 29 and you're married like you look like you just left high school um <laughs> and another thing people might find surprising is is probably just I don't know. Like, I don't think people realize that I am really introverted. <laughs> um, and it goes back to really just comfort level. Um, yeah. You know this, Ali. It, a different side of me comes out depending on who I'm around. It doesn't mean that I'm a different person. It's just that my comfort level really dictates how far outside of introversion or extroversion I go. Right. Um, and yeah, I think lastly, I mean, I have an insatiable appetite for music. That's something that, so Ooh, not just, so not just Drake, true. not just Drake. I learned this over Drake. time yeah. about Joe Marie. I'm, I'm really like, I thought I really, it was just Drake in the beginning. It's really not. But it's really not. <laughs> Drake is just like the, the young version of um, the music, but definitely <laughs> I wanted to be a DJ when I was young. I still kind of do. Um, I still think you could be. Yeah. No, that's very this possible. He this headset looks good on you. Yeah. All it's, right. a vibe. it's a vibe. I yeah. see you with the mic and the laptop. <laughs> I don't see the DJ name now and some okay. training. All right. I'm not going out there. So everyone, <laughs> for this week's episode, what we'd like you to do is like, share, comment, subscribe, and tell us Joe Marie's DJ name. Yeah. <laughs> that's what we'd really like you to do. Yeah. It sounds like a <laughs> <laughs> okay joe so we already talked about mentorship um in the preseason warm-up episode yeah. but i want to ask you today a couple chapters away from the preseason warm-up yeah um many chapters away from the preseason mm -hmm. warm-up what is your favorite resource right now um my favorite resource right now is actually it's still probably the same things i find that um youtube probably in a different space so like okay so it's a weird combination of things um so i'll be watching netflix i hear a song in a show in netflix i go and look for the song on youtube and then the song now becomes the focus music for me to do work so it's like a very weird <laughs> kind of so dynamic we go through a rabbit hole <laughs> <laughs> yeah so it's like yeah <laughs> so um but definitely i find that twitter as much as it's mm. a social media platform and it's somewhere that people can really go out there and, you know, sometimes a little messy. Um, <laughs> I find that I was able to read, I've learned a lot through Twitter. Yeah. Um, because a part of it is how you curate your, your feed. Your yeah. feed. Yeah. So Also look at how you got a job through Twitter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I have a, I have a soft spot for Twitter because Twitter really advanced a lot of things for me that quite frankly, I wasn't sure how they were going to happen otherwise. Right. Um, but yeah, definitely youtube twitter um i find that also i just really want to get back into reading because goodreads reminded me <laughs> of my very ambitious 52 book goal <laughs> we ain't we ain't even read half but it's fine i want to send you some audiobooks so you can yeah. catch up in the yeah car. man thanks right. so much thanks We're so much here. <laughs> <laughs> okay and last but not least joe where can our audience <laughs> I've, I'm, I'm laughing because where can our audience find you? They can certainly find you on the Millennial Night pages. <laughs> um, but could you share your personal 
Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. Joe Marie likes LinkedIn, guys. LinkedIn is a mood, guys. Do not run Joe away Marie from Joe Marie Malcolm LinkedIn. Gordon. <laughs> okay. So um, on Twitter, you can find me at Joe Marie Malcolm. On Instagram, you can find me at the Joe Marie Malcolm Gordon. On LinkedIn, you can find me at Joe Marie Malcolm. Um, but yeah, anywhere Joe Marie Malcolm is where hopefully it's me. Um, it's the consistent. I don't There's know many other Joe Marie Malcolms. No, they're out there. They're, they're out, out there. there. Okay. You know. Um. Yeah. But what will There's help you to know that it's each me? Aww. <laughs> <laughs> Ali. <laughs> Ten but, years down yeah. the line, meet another Joe Marie. <laughs> Crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the key thing to realize it's the same photo. So if you see someone with you know short hair in a pink pink background, <laughs> Malcolm Mavericks, pretty sure it's me. So yeah, that's where you can find me. And I'm very open to conversations to help people to navigate their career paths. Yes, I find that I get those is. questions a lot. Um, and it's not that I am specifically or, you know, otherwise predisposed to answer these questions, but I have gone through it myself. So I think I can offer some insights. She can. She's been an amazing peer mentor to me and to so many others. So Joe, it's time to close out the show. <laughs> how, how do we do that again? <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> so, Joe, I cannot thank so you. So, you're not you're gonna you're not gonna ask me for my help with this? <laughs> not e- not yet. We're not in that part. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Now I say this, thanks to the this, guests. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens when you know what goes on. Oh, I'm boy. gonna behave like a stranger. <sighs> yes, Ali. This over is the behind you. the scenes episode. <laughs> over to you in studio. So, Joe, I can't thank you enough for having this conversation with me and, of course, for sharing more about yourself with Mm -hmm. our wonderful Millennial Mike audience. And as always, thank you to our audience for spending time with the Millennial Mike. Because Chapter 9, Part 1 and 2 are all about Ali and Joe, we're raffling off a joint mentorship session as a part of our mentorship (laughs) holiday (laughs) giveaways. And we're calling it Milmas! (laughs) So follow us on Instagram and Twitter to stay in the loop or email us at bookings at themillennialmike.com for your chance to win a mentorship session with both Joe and I. Like, comment, subscribe. Tell us who you want to hear from, what you want to learn about, and whether or not the Millennial Mike content is hitting the mark. Okay, Joe, let's do this like we always do. <laughs> I'm Ali. I'm confused. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, Joe, I'm going to need your help with this part. <laughs> I'm Ali. I'm Joe. And, and this, this has been the Millennial Mike. Hello, Millennial Massive. I interrupt this closing message to remind you about our holiday giveaway called Milmos. Follow us on Instagram at the Millennial Mike or Twitter at the Mill Mike to learn about Milmos and for your chance to win a mentorship session with one of our amazing guests, as well as with me and Joe. So follow us and get in the know. (laughs) Thank you so much, Millennial Massive, for listening to this incredible episode with my co-host, Joe Marie Malcolm Gordon. See you next time.